God lets down the hedge. Which if you read Job 1 and 2, you'll see. That's what the devil says. There's no way I can get to Job, Satan said to God, because you've set a hedge around about him. And so that means whenever Satan finally got to Job, it was because not Job, not Satan, God let the hedge down. Because God said, now you go ahead and do what you will, only don't touch him the first time. In chapter 2, only don't take his life. In other words, God gave him the access. So you can tell Satan that if you've got any authority over me right now, it's because God gave it to you. Amen. And God's not going to kill me, and therefore neither can you. You can only put so much on me as God has said that you can. And then whenever it's reached that point, then here I come back with the victory. Because you can only go so far, the, the trial can only last so long, and then whenever that time comes, then you've lost. You see, the devil will try to continue to get the victory, although you know that he's lost from the, from the very start. He'll continue to work and work, and then when that, when that time comes, there's a, always a time for the trial to be completed, for it to have done a work. Trials aren't just there because it's the thing for God to do to you. They are there for a purpose, dear friends. And that purpose, basically, there are a lot of sign things, but that purpose, basically, is to teach you how to trust in God. If you never had any trials, how would you ever know how to trust? How would you ever know that you had faith? What does Jesus say to them here in verse 25? Where is your faith? They must not have had any here. What they had was so little, Matthew calls it little faith, it was so little because it would only do things, small things, whenever he was around to help them, whenever things looked like they were going well and they were having a good day. But now when they're in a problem, he said, where is your faith? They came to him, awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. <clears throat> and he said unto them, where is your faith? <clears throat> That's the question. Question's not, where's God? Question's not, where's his faith? Question is, where is your faith? You see, you find out it's true after all. What we've said before around here, that God expects you to have faith. That's why I don't have a counseling day. Tuesday's not a counseling day at my home. And I, I know a whole lot of pastors who's, Tuesday is a counseling day or Thursday is a counseling day or Friday or Monday or Wednesday or whatever is a counseling day. Where is scripture for our position right here? Where is your faith? Counsel from some religious figure? Oh, I know sometimes when people are new or when they've really got a serious problem, they might need help. But the question still is, where is your faith? And if you listen, he'll ask you that. What are you looking at someone else for, looking to someone else? Where is your faith? Can you say as Job did, I believe, in Job 42 and verse 10, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. There's nothing impossible to him. And he said over in Matthew 17, 20, that there would be nothing impossible to you. Matthew 17, 20, why couldn't you cast out the demons? Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith, as if ye have faith, not my faith or someone else's faith, if ye have faith. You see, I'm not trying to get a corner on the market in faith. We're trying to teach you how to have faith. I'm not trying to get a corner on the market and say, now the only way you can get anything is come and let me pray with you about it. You know, I guess some people like all the attention. They'd like to think that they're the one that did everything. We want to teach you how to get faith. I don't want a corner on the market. And I don't want people to have to come and say, you know, well, you help me. Now, there are times for agreement in prayer. That's scriptural. It doesn't matter whether you're a new believer or an old believer. There's times Jesus said, two of you agree for that thing in prayer, and I'll give it to you. There are times he said, call for the elders of the church and let them anoint you with all the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise you up. There are times for those things. But the point still is, we're not on that subject, we're on this subject. I don't want a corner on the market so that people have to run to me and say, now, you know, where is your faith? I'll say, mine is mine. Where is your faith? 
because Jesus, Jesus evidently expected them to have faith of their own and not to have to bother him about that situation. I know that just like a bulldozer goes over the denominational mind when they think, oh, but God, it's always by your grace. We always need your help. But I think it's as clear as clear could be. In these passages, he expected for them not to bother him. Not that he minded being bothered, but he wanted them to have the opportunity to exercise and demonstrate their own faith. He expected them not to wake him up. Now, if you don't think that he expected that, then why did he come back with the question, where is your faith? Amen. Yeah, that's right. He expected them to have faith Amen. and just to have left him alone and deliver themselves from that situation. So he says, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, then ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing, sh nothing shall be impossible unto you. That's why we teach it this way, because that's right here in the Word. Jesus doesn't say, come to me every time. He said, claim it yourself. Rebuke the devil yourself. Don't say, God, come and rebuke the devil for me, or get a deliverance minister to cast that demon out for you. And some like it that way. I'm talking about some people and some ministers. They want to keep the ministers a corner on the market and have everyone come to them for everything. Well, I'll, I'll pray about it and, you know, we'll see what the Lord says or I'll pray about it and we'll make sure that the Lord does that for you. Where's your faith? You'll never grow up and mature unless you have to stand on your own two feet when it comes to faith. Not standing on someone else, not looking to someone else, but standing on your own feet and answering that question when he says, where is your faith? Say, Lord, it's right here in my heart based on your word. And that's why I'm not bothering you or bothering anyone else about it. And then you'll find that it works for you. Your faith can't be in people. Your, where is your faith? Where is it? It can't be based in this country's economy. That's for sure. The economy goes up and down and up and down and now it's pretty good last year was pretty bad and it'll probably be pretty bad next year just up and down like a yo-yo where is your faith where is it where is it where is your faith it can't be in this country's economy it can't be in this world system it can't be in the denominational system that's where some people's faith is my faith is in the church you know the church has always been here it's a rock of ages that's a purely an invention of man, the denominational system. And besides that, the church hasn't been here forever anyway. It's only been here since Jesus established the church. So that would be a false concept to say it's been here forever. It's a rock of ages. It's only a rock of the last 2,000 years. So you better not have your faith in the system. You better not have your faith in your employer. Amen. You see, getting on that subject for a moment, you have to watch out. Sure, the Bible teaches that you should respect your employer, but you better not look to him or to anyone else as the source of your needs because sooner or later you'll compromise something there at work because here is someone that's over you. I'm talking about your boss. We've all been in that position before. Here's someone over you, and there's always almost at least a temptation to be a little afraid because they are the ones if you think incorrectly, who supply the bread for your table. They are the ones that do it. Your boss does. And if he fires you, there goes your income. Where is your faith? It better not be in your employer. You'll compromise something sooner or later to win his approval or her approval sometimes. Your faith better be in Philippians 4.19. My God is my source. And it's my God who will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Sure, you should respect your employer and do what they say. But if you've been in that position before, you know what I'm talking about. There's just a fine line there where you have to keep in your mind, I'm not, I'm not held responsible in the final analysis to anyone. I'm not to answer to anyone but to God, to Jesus Christ. And no one is responsible for meeting all of my needs except my Heavenly Father. Amen. Now, he may work through my employer, but that still doesn't matter. The source is still my Heavenly Father. 
And so whether my employer is there today and gone tomorrow, it doesn't make any difference. I still have my source, and that's my Heavenly Father, who says that he knows the number of the hairs on my head. Cast your care upon him. He said, for he cares for you. Jesus said in Matthew 6, why worry? He said, the sparrows don't worry. Five times there, he says, take no thought for your material needs. And you can be in that place of faith if you recognize who your source is. And it can't be your employer. You can't even begin to look into that direction because sooner or later you'll compromise. That's why pastors and churches that are on the church's salary as well as a whole lot of other things that are on their salary, if you're on man's salary, then you're preaching to men. It always works that way. I know it because I've been in that position in the past. Whenever you are on someone else's salary list, then you are working for and unto them. And you have to free yourself from that. You see, we're not, I don't look to the people here in this church for my financial needs. No, I don't either. I praise God for your generous offerings and for your love and that's only because that shows that you enjoy the word and you're learning the word here but i don't look to that proof of the fact is whenever we came up here i didn't know any of you and all of our needs were still met anyway so there's no sense in going back on god whenever he's already proven himself faithful time and time again and i always if someone even even frowns the wrong way i say i challenge you just stop giving i don't need your money I mean that as much as I can mean anything. I don't need your money. And I see, I don't let the mind say, well, then what about this? Or then where is it going to come from? You say, well, you say that because you know no one would ever do it. I challenge you to. You know, some people, you'll meet some doubters. They'll say, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> and so I would just tell them, all right, the invitation is open to you. If you're a doubter, then you fit the bill. I'm not talking to people who believe if you're a doubter, then you fit the bill. Because I'm, it works for all of us. I'm not looking to you. Who are you looking to? Who's your source for all of your needs? It better be heavenly work and not earthly work. Oh, friends, I'll tell you what. Because pastors in most churches, they're dependent on that church. And they know it. And they have to act as though they are. They do. You know, that, that corporation there is what butters their bread for them. And they have to let everyone know that because if you tell people God's my source, that makes people mad. That takes the fun out of giving, they think. <laughs> sure, you couldn't say that in a denominational church. Who does he think he is? I'll just stop giving them. <laughs> Why? Because they like that old selfish pleasure in... in <laughs> and keeping their pastor in bondage so that he has to do what they want him to or they'll stop giving to him. And they like that idea. They like that situation. They like that arrangement. And for him to say, you're not my source. God is my source. Oh, they would be furious with that. <laughs> Just furious. They want to keep you all bound up. That's why whenever you go out in time ministry, you've got to be sure you know who your source is. Your source is not man. Men will disappoint you sooner or later. Your source is not them. And it works for you on your job, although God might be using your job to meet your needs. That's not the source. That is a channel. But it's not the source. Just a channel. And channels can easily change. But as long as the connection is still resumed between you and that big ocean of blessings there, they'll keep coming to you then. You see, there might be a five-foot pipe that leads from that ocean, that huge ocean of blessings down to your little small needs compared to all that God has by which he can meet your needs, that pipe may corrode one day and just get all clogged up with stuff. Well, that doesn't stop God. He'll just put another pipe in, attach it to the same ocean, and attach it to you, the same person. And here'll come all the blessings again. And that's all the job is. It's just that pipe. It's just that channel that brings the blessings from your source to you. And he can change that. He can put down one and raise up another. So don't look to that. That's what gives you a bold, strong faith when you know you're not looking to anyone for your needs. You're looking only to your Heavenly Father because then you always feel dependent on someone else. And it's a terrible feeling. You always feel that you're kind of dependent on someone 
and they're kind of over you somehow, and you're, you're in bondage to them. Really, whether you can help it or not, you feel that you're in bondage to them. Uh, maybe they've helped you in the past or something. And I'm not saying you shouldn't uh, be grateful if someone blesses you financially here in the church. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying let the giver and let the receiver recognize that God is the one who gets all of the glory. And whether you gave them that money, praise God that you did. You were the source, I mean the channel that day that the source used. Praise God for that. The person should be grateful that someone was willing to be a channel. But at the same time, you see, some people are so anti-others, they would say, well, it doesn't matter whether you did it, God was going to do it anyway, and become almost cold towards someone, and you don't deserve any blessing. And then someone else is just looking around to see who's got the money for them, rather than looking to God. And you've got to be right in between both of those, looking to the Lord, and he'll use someone to bless you with that. But make sure that you remember who your source is. And I say that for your own benefit. It doesn't matter if I give you something. We've helped a number of people out in the church financially on a number of occasions. And I just rejoice in the opportunity to do that. But I say to the person, whoever you are out there, don't look to me as your source. Amen. God is your source. It doesn't matter if I gave it to you or someone else. It doesn't matter who gave it to you. Look to the Lord as your source. That's Philippians 4.19. Because you start looking to people and they'll disappoint you. The old well will dry up sooner or later. Get down to the bottom where it tastes a little stagnant down there near the bottom of the well. Right. You know, the old type of wells, not the wells with underground water, but that run off the roof down into the hole in the ground that you've made. The cistern there gets down there at the bottom and it's not fresh water. And that's what will happen with some people. But you see, God never runs out of his material spiritual or whatever blessings physical blessings that he has they don't ever get down near the bottom and get old there but sometimes man's blessings will so i don't know i believe i'm talking to some of you look to the lord as your source that will keep you free from being in bondage and fear and in an unscriptural subjection or submission to someone else now did you hear what i said an unscriptural subjection or submission to someone else praise god that they're the ones that the lord is using <coughs> to help you out and if you want to thank them for it then that's fine but don't look to them as your source and the person who's giving the giving don't think that it's because how good you are that you did something for them Amen. because there you're trying to keep that person in bondage to you and it is not a good position to be in it's really not. There's some more things I could say. I hesitate saying. But you want to free yourself from anything that speaks of that. Or you'll probably be carrying around with you that, that feeling of being in bondage to someone else. Not being able just to trust God totally for everything. You know, that's why being on a salary as far as a minister is concerned would be the thing that I would dislike the most. Dislike the most. Because you're just not free to trust God. You're just not free. When your old denominational church puts you on a salary, you're just not free to trust God. Then you're in bondage to someone else. And it's not that you want to be a rebel or be independent in a bad sense of the word, but be independent in a good sense because you're trusting in God. You're not trusting in anyone else around you. And all the blessings will just come. He probably won't make counterfeit $100 bills for you. He'll give you some real ones through someone else. Oh, yeah. He couldn't make counterfeits. Oh, I guess he could. He'd have to confuse the whole treasury department to make them think they had made those 10 serial number C bills. That way it wouldn't be counterfeit. He would have the true serial numbers on them. You know, I've heard people say God could never rain money out, money out of heaven because it'd be counterfeit money. Well, he could... <laughs> sure why couldn't he just get all of them confused in the minting printing department there in the treasury and make them think they had made 100 100 dollar bills and they've got all the serial numbers stuck away and and those are legitimate 100 dollar bills floating around this country but they didn't make them he rained them down out of heaven you ever thought about that before you ever heard someone say god would never rain money down out of heaven because he's not a counterfeiter 
I've heard it before. Because other people have said, based on the story of Elijah, oh, God will just rain things out of heaven for you if you need them. And then some others say, oh, they get real pious and spiritual. God would be a counterfeiter then. <laughs> There's a number of ways he could work his way around that and not be a counterfeiter Amen. and have official sea bills floating around that he's going to float right over to you that no one even knows that are in existence. Check them out and see what data are on them. See how new they are. Maybe some of those bills you have are new bills. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, there's nothing too difficult for him. Uh, Psalm 91 comes to mind. Psalm 91, the first two verses. Hallelujah. With him asking you the question, where is your faith? Psalm 91 and verse 1, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God. In Him will I trust. It's all summed up here in one verse. Do you say that to him? Lord, you are my refuge. You are my fortress. You are my God. In you do I trust. Don't let your mind get into these things. There are untold blessings in the future if you'll ask the Lord for them and trust him for them. Amen. There are no restraints with God. The only restraints are put on him by men. And it's shown by the fact of him asking, why do you limit the Holy God, the Holy One of Israel? Why do you limit the Holy One of Israel? I'm not the one doing it. The only restraints on him are man-made, man-imposed restraints. Why do you limit the Holy One of Israel? Would it have been too much for him to expect that they could have stilled the storm themselves? No, that would have been limiting the Holy One of Israel. He said, where is your faith? Where is your faith? You see, there will always be others around you who have faith. They were right near Jesus. There will always be others who have faith. But whether they have faith is not going to help you. That's not the point. He says, where is your faith? There will always be others. Well, not always. If you get way out beyond this church, there won't be anyone who has faith. But around this church, there will always be others who have faith. I know I do. So there will always at least be one of us near you who has faith, me. Hallelujah. But you see, James says that a man will say, Thou hast faith and I have works. But James says you can't just say that you have faith. I mean, I just did. But James says, I will say, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. See, my faith is there and is proven because of the works that the faith has done. My whole, life and my whole life and testimony of salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and coming up here is a witness to God's faithfulness and to the fact that I have faith in the promises of God. You can't say that you have faith and expect anyone to believe you unless you do what James says, demonstrate your faith by your works, and then we'll all know that you have faith. You see, there'll always be one of us around or several of us around or most of us around who have faith. But where is your faith? Everyone has to have it. And so it doesn't exclude those that don't sit on the front row or the second row or the third row or those that aren't of the male gender. It includes everyone. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? Is it in Psalm 91 too? I will say of the Lord, Lord, you are my refuge. Amen. Hallelujah. You are my fortress. You are my God. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, that no man can serve two masters. No man can serve two masters. He'll hate the one, love the other, despise one, hold to the other. Man cannot serve God and mammon. Man cannot serve God and his employer because he would have two masters in. Psalm 91, 2, who's my God? Lord, you are my God. Amen. can only serve one God. And in you will I trust. Hallelujah. Surely you will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. 
the deadly pestilence, those trials and troubles. You will cover me with your feathers and under your wings will I trust. You see, they weren't trusting in Mark 4. They weren't trusting in Matthew 8. They weren't trusting in Luke 8. They were worried and afraid. And so he said, why is it that you're so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Faith is just the opposite from fear, or to say it another way, fear is just the reverse of faith. He says, why are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? If they would have had faith, they wouldn't have been afraid. And the only way you can get rid of fear and worry is to replace it with something. You can't just have a house, Matthew 12, that's empty and swept and garnished. Empty and swept and garnished. Swept and garnished, yes, but not empty at the same time. Amen. And you have to replace worry and fear with faith. Amen. It's really the same mechanism that works there. The same one that is afraid is also the one that believes. And it's you, the personality. You're either afraid or you're trusting in God. You're either resting under his shadow and under his wings and under his feathers or you're peeking out, looking around, trying to figure out what to do next. What's my next step? Where is your faith? Is it really in your heart and therefore on your lips? Because uh, Romans 10 says that the word of faith is in our heart and it's going to be in our mouth because we speak, we believe, and we confess unto possession. Is it really there based on the promises of God? Well, you don't want to wait until you're in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Because about the only thing you'll be able to do, and hopefully you'll have someone there who has faith, is to wake them up and say, friend, help us. We perish. Rather than rebuking the wind yourself. He actually requires us to have the type of faith that can reverse the elements out there. I've done it before. I know that it works. He did it, and then he told us we should be doing it. If the need arises, there's no sense in being a martyr out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and witnessing to the fish as you go down. <laughs> he expects you to do something about it. That doesn't re mean rebuke every time the wind blows and you're trying to plant your carrot seeds outside <laughs> like I was doing last year, and here comes the wind. You know, you try to plant carrot seeds, and it's got to be still out there. And we ended up with carrots growing all over the garden. <laughs> We did have one row of them, but they were growing everywhere. Wind blew those things. But that doesn't mean you get your mantle and your staff like Moses and rebuke the elements there. But whenever the devil's trying to take your life, then you better start fighting back. Amen. Don't call on God to help. You better start fighting back then. Hallelujah. And sometimes he requires us to reverse the elements. He required Isaiah and Hezekiah's day to reverse the turn of the earth. And that's a much greater thing than just stopping the elements out there. The shadow had to go backwards on the measurement there, according to what Hezekiah wanted. And Isaiah said, that's what it'll be then. Joshua, in Joshua chapter 10, he had to get the earth not to reverse, but to stop itself. And then denominational Christians say, oh, I never heard of such nonsense commanding it not to sleep. <laughs> Now, and they'll say, the sleep can't hear you. And they're right. But we'll tell them, Jesus rebuked the wind. And what are you going to do with that then? And they don't really know anything to do. I mean, he didn't get a big box and catch all of the wind or something in it. He was talking to someone or something that hurt him. Or he wouldn't have rebuked it. He would have just practiced mind control, mental suggestion or something. But to rebuke means he had to say something. Someone or something hurt him. And since we know things don't hear... It must have been a one, a person, someone hurt him. The devil. The one who had started that storm up. And Jesus, of course, turns it around to a lesson of faith for his disciples. And so what are you going to do with the problem? You can turn it around into a lesson of faith for yourself. Well, now I'll know what to do if this ever comes up again. God brought it along, used the devil to bring it along, and now I've turned it into a lesson of faith. Better than untying magically Boy Scout, Boy Scout knots. I found out that here's a good, true, biblical object lesson that I actually did. And it'll teach me next time what to do whenever the ship is going down or what to do whenever your car is up on two wheels. And God will do those things to encourage you just to trust him for more the next day. 
and more the next week and to show you how faithful he is that if you'll put your trust in him that he'll deliver you